That's fine. Okay, let's. It was part of it. I can do that much. that far? It should. <laughs>
do that yet. There we go. Show the board. Yep. Let's see. Video settings. Enable HD. Yes. It's good. Okay. Okay, everybody got a copy of the uh, gases from about a minute? You need one. Okay. Let's see. Oh, that's not good. That's not good. Here we go. Let's review. How I did it. You need some too? Yes, please. works, I'll have today's uh, lecture <laughs> posted on Blackboard. We just go into the, the particular exam that it pertains to. This will be exam three, and you can't miss it. It'll be right on that page. <clears throat> okay. It would help if I show the slide. Unmute. Go. All right. Gases. Oh, welcome. I apologize. I have to go get take care of this sinus infection. Ah, uh, okay. So I'll I'll count you as present. Okay. Let's see, how do I? Uh, okay. <coughs> Not what I want. Okay. I'm on a learning curve here. Uh, I did this the last class. How did I do it? Breakout rooms? No. Uh, chat, share screen, roles, participants. I don't know how to do it now. Okay. Let's carry on before I waste all my time playing with gases. Gases. The next exam, uh, exam three, is on this chapter only, gases. And it'll be the last, the exam on this one will be the last one you have before midterms are due. <clears throat> you want to pull gases out as a separate topic because the study of gases is so important uh, for historical reasons, if for no other reason, you, if you were to <clears throat> treasure up the day. the uh, modern chemistry was a development, an outgrowth, if you will, of study of gases. And the reason for that was that gases were easier to deal with. Strange as it may seem, 
the alchemists, of course, they, they missed the, the, the solids because they were busy trying to gold out of lead. But the real scientists realized early on that the study of gases uh, had certain advantages. Uh, one of the primary advantages for studying gases is they all behave alike. It doesn't matter what gas you have, it's going to have similar physical properties. Um, and that's where they started, studying the physical properties. And the reason they're so much alike is because there's so much space between the molecules that the size and, and, and characteristics of the molecule itself are insignificant. So in those situations, we have what we call an ideal gas. So like I said, these particles are, are semi-independent from one another. Um, they're made up of, they could be atoms, like all of these noble gases are atomic gases, or you have diatomic gases, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, chlorine, chlorine, bromine. No, not bromine, just chlorine. Bromine is diatomic, ionized diatomic, but these are the gases. And of course, if you filled out that periodic table, you already know that. <clears throat> and they're moving very fast. You, you can calculate. Hello, my headset, please. You can calculate the average velocity of uh, the gases, uh, and hopefully, I'll be able to show you how to do that later. And uh, the average velocity is pretty close to the speed of sound. Yeah this temperature, at room temperature. Another characteristic of gases is that they are all completely miscible, which means when you put two or more of them together, you always get a solution every time. Does that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> Why does it make sense? Because there's so much space in there. There's room for everybody. I put two gases together, I could care less, you know. It's like I'm on this side of the room and you're on that side of the room. We don't interact. Gases do, however, possess a mass. You can't weigh the gas. And uh, let's see. I don't think we do that in this. We can do that in this one. We'll check just to be sure. Yes, we do. The very last lab. We're going to actually weigh a gas <clears throat> in the Dumas method. But they possess mass, and since they possess mass and they're moving very fast, they have kinetic energy. Because any particle or any object has kinetic energy based on that formula. It's got mass and it's moving. So it has kinetic energy. Which means if it smacks into something, you're going to feel it. I mean, somebody's going to feel it. It might be just another molecule that feels it. For us to feel it, it would take several billion of them to strike you at once when you feel the, the pressure, like wind, for instance. <clears throat> so gases do have mass and kinetic energy. We have to assume that they're in random motion. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. The reason we have to assume they're in random motion is because we don't have the cap, the, uh, tracking and calculating capability to follow every molecule in there independent from one another. So we just have to assume that their motion is random. Okay, we're going to look at uh, first of all how the gas laws operate. And remember a law just says this is what happens. Under these circumstances, this happens every time. We don't know why, 
It just happens. So there's several of those laws. And then we'll follow that up with a, a theory that tries to synthesize all those laws into a coherent model and explain why the gases do what they do. We start from an ideal position. In other words, an ideal gas has certain characteristics. And then if you notice any deviation in those characteristics, you're talking about a real gas. There are equations that go with all these laws. We'll talk about those one by one. And why is it? Another reason that gases are so important is because uh, without gases, we'd be in serious trouble. <laughs> right? <laughs> we might suffocate. But even if we could breathe and the gases were very thin, they wouldn't be able to protect us from the solar radiation, cosmic rays, which the ozone layer in the upper atmosphere does, protects us from the, the worst of the ultraviolet rays that comes from the sun. And there are various components of gas, of the atmosphere, that are necessary for life, right? Not the least of which is that one right there. 79% of the atmosphere is made up of nitrogen. Now, we can't use it as it is. And, and uh, uh, higher order plants can't use it as it is. It takes the enzyme systems of microorganisms to make this nitrogen useful. We call it fixing. So the enzyme systems of microorganisms, some of them, will convert that into ammonia and nitrates. And then our systems can use them. Well, plants can use them. Convert them into proteins and uh, nucleic acids. And then we eat the plants. So eventually, it all goes back to this. And, and it runs in a cycle. So everybody's heard of the water cycle. Right? The water evaporates and then it um, uh, exceeds the saturation point and condenses and falls as rain. Well, the nitrogen goes in a cycle also. It starts out here runs through this series, becomes part of the biomass, and then it's degraded. And some microbes No, that's a headphone in my chest. Compounds. It's made for headphones. And convert them back to nitrogen and use the energy to drive their systems. So it all goes in a cycle. Oh, there are other it can be uh, very important one. <laughs> Is carbon dioxide. Without carbon dioxide, plants can't make their cell walls. Right? So the EPA has been trying to make carbon dioxide a pollutant for several years, which is just sheer idiocy. You have to have carbon dioxide. In fact, there's ample evidence that an increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will increase plant productivity. That's been proven. So increased temperatures, whether they're caused by CO2 in the atmosphere or not. Increased temperatures, increased CO2, will increase plant productivity. Um, Can you hear him? There are some, granted, CO2 hearing there such? are some chemicals, gases in the atmosphere that are pollutants. I mean, just visit, uh, Los Angeles on a nice summer day. And they get their inversion layer. It's just a blanket of smog. A lot of that is uh, ozone. Some of it's carbon monoxide. Uh, some of it's oxides of nitrogen, especially generated from internal combustion engines. See what I do with twice a week? If the layer is inverted, you get the hot air on the bottom and the cold air on the top. No, the other way around. Hot air on top, cold on the bottom. No, the other way around. Hot on the bottom, cold. Cold traps the hot on the bottom. 
<clears throat> and you get those gases that build up. So that's a, a big uh, alert goes out for smog alert. So there are some pollutants, but they're localized. There are no rhythm, there are no global pollutants. Okay, so when uh, modern science, chemistry and science, was beginning to cut its teeth, uh, certain things could be measured about gases. And this depends in, uh, largely upon the technology that was available. You know, how would you measure certain characteristics of gases? We can identify characteristics of gases by their temperature, right? by the volume they occupy, uh, by the pressure that they exert on the container that holds them. Remember, gases have to be contained. They have to be confined. Um, at least the study them, they do. Uh, they acquire the shape of the container and the volume of the container. So temperature, volume, pressure, and then how much of the gas is there in there? And we use a small n for that, which stands for moles. How much gas actually is there? We know these four characteristics, we can fully characterize the physics of any uh, trapped gas. So pressure, how do we measure pressure? Well, it turns out that the barometer was invented to do just that, measure pressure. And it was invented by an Italian Torricelli in the middle of the 17th century. And it was, it was a fairly successful endeavor and it was widely adopted very, very quickly because it could do exactly what it was intended to do. <laughs> Measure what's the pressure, what's the, the force per unit area. In that container. So how did Torricelli do it? Well, he searched for solids wouldn't work and gases wouldn't work. He had to search for a liquid that would respond to uh, forces on its surface. And what he came up with was uh, a big a bucket of some liquid. And then he had this inverted tube that was only open at one end. And I'm sure he thought about using water because it's plentiful, easy to purify. But the problem with water is if you put water in your barometer, you need a tube that's at least 33 feet long to respond to changes in air pressure. And that's the first thing that was measured, air pressure. So he needed something that was <coughs> denser than air. And in fact, something that was uh, I mean, denser than water. And what he settled on was mercury, because mercury is a liquid at room temperature, which is great. Um, and uh, nothing else is. And they understood mercury. Alchemists have been playing with mercury for. Um, so, and then he also filled the tube with mercury and put his thumb over it and then inverted it and submerged his hand in the mercury and then removed his thumb. Okay, so what happened? Well, as soon as he did, the level dropped in the mercury. Uh, the mercury in the tube dropped. Okay, so what's holding it up? It didn't drop all the way to the bottom, so something has to be holding it up. Right. So he reasoned that there was a force, the atmosphere above was applying force to this, and they knew that uh, when you apply force on a fluid of any kind, it's transmitted throughout the fluid. So you apply force here, and it's transmitted all the way up there, and the force is enough to uh, suspend that column of mercury. 
If the force decreases, then this column decreases. Force increases, then the column goes back up. So that was the first measure of atmospheric pressure. And all you had to do was just make a mark here and then watch it. Basically, what he's talking about is like your um, mm -hmm. uh, globe upstairs. Um, <clears throat> let me see. Can I mute this? Yeah. There we go. Can you still hear me? No? Unmute. You can hear me now? I can still hear you. Oh, okay. I just I thought this was working, but my mic when my mic wasn't. No, muted. I think you have to mute uh, from Zoom. Uh, I don't know how to fix that. Okay, I'll mute you on my end then. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, Torricelli and others, they took this barometer, he called it. And you throw it in the back of your ox cart, you go up the mountain. Sure enough, go up the mountain, column drops. You go from wherever you are down to the sea level, column comes up. So the reason there's more air above you at sea level, so it holds the column up higher. What they needed was a scale so that when I talk to some other scientist in the world, then I can use the same scale and they understand what I mean by. The, mer the column was this tall, or the column was that tall. So eventually they came up with a metric system. And it, uh, it was used to measure the height of the column. And the height of the column is from this surface here up to the top of that column. That represents air pressure. It was also used uh, to investigate weather phenomena. So when the they noticed that if you just set your barometer on the table and just watch it over days, they noticed when the weather started to come in and get bad, level dropped. And when the weather, when that weather passed and the weather got good again, the level rose. So they started to associate high pressure with good weather, low pressure with bad weather. And that still holds today. Okay. They used it to predict the weather. All you had to do was just watch it. Now, this scale, the metric system, is usually in millimeters of mercury. Right? So we take one atmosphere of pressure is equal to a column of mercury that's suspended up to 760 millimeters of mercury. Okay. So it's about, what, three quarters of a meter. So notice that if you've got an equality, we have a conversion factor. Right? If you know atmospheres, you can use this to convert to millimeters of mercury. If you know millimeters of mercury, you can use it to convert back to atmosphere. You just have to put this over here or that over there. And it's equal to one. Remember, conversion factors are all equal to one. There's the height of our, it was generally accepted or established at 760 millimeters is equal to one atmosphere. It would be difficult to find any place on earth where you could actually say this is one atmosphere. So it's somewhat arbitrary, not exactly, but somewhat arbitrary definition. So if we, at the air pressure at the Raleigh County Airport is 694 millimeters mercury. That's because we're at a half mile high. Okay. So it should be less than one atmosphere. And we can do the conversion. We take that, use our conversion factor, and determine that the pressure at the Raleigh County Airport is, uh, that's a different name now, isn't it? That's not the name of the airport anymore, isn't it? I think it's a different name. I can't remember what it is, though. It still has uh, these, what do they call this lettering system? All airports have three letters. I'm sorry? 
now that's closed. Anyway. <clears throat> Get what? This right here? Yeah. Well, one atmosphere equals 760 millimeters. That's your no, I mean, how do you get the answer? Oh, divide this into that. Yeah. That's in the numerator. This is in the denominator. So you just divide that into that. And you get that value. Should be less than one, right? Because 760 is greater than 695, and it's in the denominator. So you divide it. And you get something less than one. If you go up in winter place, you're at higher altitude. So you should have a lower air pressure. Do the same conversion, find that it's a lot less 0.88 of an atmosphere. Or if you go, where are we going here? It doesn't say. Say so you go down to the uh, Dead Sea, right? that's below sea level, and you should get a, a higher than one atmosphere pressure. Okay. So there are other ways to express pressure. The standard or the, the international system units are pascals, abbreviated PA. The reason that they are accepted in the international system is because they're interconvertible, easily interconvertible with uh, the fundamental units. So the fundamental unit of length is the meter. Uh, Newton is not a fundamental unit, it's a derived unit, but it can be related to a fundamental. So that way you can go backwards and forwards. You can go, uh, you can relate many other physical constants to air pressure through this relationship. One Pascal is one Newton per square meter. One Newton is a measure of force. That's all it is. Um, Sometimes we, at least in this country, we measure the air pressure in terms of inches of mercury. In fact, the barometer on the wall in the lab spits out its values in inches of mercury. So when we do our Boyle's law lab, we need to use, we need to incorporate the atmospheric pressure into our calculations. Since it measures it in inches of mercury, we've got to use this conversion, 29.92 inches of mercury, is equal to one atmosphere. So we can convert those inches of mercury that are measured into atmospheres. And we're going to be measuring the pressure in a container uh, with a tire gauge. So that's going to be pounds per square inch. So we've got to convert pounds per square inch to atmospheres. Then we can add the two together. So there's the pounds per square inch, that's one atmosphere. Uh, one bar is this many pascals. Uh, that's a measure that's used in weather. Right? If you see a weather map, you see the isobars, I call them, the lines on the map that are the same pressure. And you see full lines. They're not measured in bars, though. They're measured in millibars. So there's uh, one atmosphere is 1,013 millibars. So you can convert. All you need to know is what's the equivalence. So if you know what the equivalence is, you have a conversion factor. And that's all we've done here. We convert PSI to one atmosphere, and then we can convert one atmosphere to inches of mercury. Oops, I went too far. Back up. There we go. 
inches of mercury, or we can take millimeters of mercury and convert it to atmospheres and use the relationship of atmospheres to the millibars and convert it. So that's, that's one of those chain conversions that we are so enamored by. Now, uh, this use of mercury to measure pressure is not confined just to atmospheres. Right? Well, doctor's offices now, they use the, uh, they use cuffs that have little dials on them. Right? But originally, and some doctor's offices still have them on the wall, is the mercury speaking on manometer. They have them on the wall and have a little basket and the cup goes in the basket, but they never use it. They always have the one on the on the rolling cart where you just wrap the thing around the patient's arm and then push the button and go do something else. But all you have to do is enclose this space right here and then run a tube to a, uh, uh, a bladder, wrap it around somebody's arm, and then pump it up. And when you pump it up, you apply uh, counter pressure that is registered here. And you say, you'll see the mercury rise and rise and rise until you stop pumping it. And then when you start to let it off, it'll start to drop. And then if you're listening at the same time, you can hear those uh, Karatkov sounds. Um, you're listening for, there are like six or seven of them, but you're only listening for two. One for the systolic and one for the diastolic. And you'll see the, the, the mercury drop if you use the old style. And then it'll come down to a point, and then it'll go boom, 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 right there. And then it'll go down, and then it'll go boom, 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 boom. So there's your systolic, and there's your diastolic. Um, so the point is that uh, this technology has been used uh, widely to do other things. Now, that's the way you would do measure blood pressure, but uh, chemists would use this, they would uh, seal that off and then uh, have a tube running over to their container. And then the container would uh, have a pressure in it, like you'd hook it up and then you'd open a valve and let the pressure inside uh, impinge upon that mercury column and you'd find out just how much pressure there was in that container. So you're, you're characterize the gas that's in the container by its pressure. Uh, okay. So this is just an exercise in conversion factors. We don't have to mess with that. Let's get to the laws. So the gas laws. The gas laws are going to make use of uh, one or more of these. And the first one that was uh, proposed and actually proven was Boyle's Law in the middle of the 17th century. So he got hold of this uh, uh, Torricelli's barometer really quickly and decided to use it to quantify the quantify and characterize gases based on their pressure and volume. So what he did was he confined the gas and he measured the pressure of it relative to the mercury. Well, actually, he didn't use the barometer. He used the same concept as the barometer. Boyle used a J tube. Okay, so it's open at one end, closed at the other. And he started pouring mercury in here. And it would puddle in the bottom and it would keep puddling until it touched that curve. And when it touched that curve, it trapped the gas in here. Right, so this gas is trapped. He's not gonna put any more in it. So that's constant, right? No more moles in there, it's the same amount, same amount of moles. He's going to um, have a, a temperature control room at the very least. That's fairly constant temperature. So he controls that as constant. That's not changing. So these two are going to change volume and pressure. So the volume is here. 
and the pressure is how much mercury you keep adding. So as you add mercury, it builds up on this side, but it doesn't go as high as that one. That's because it's got this gas, trapped gas in here is pushed back. So he measured the difference in height from there to there. And that difference in height is the pressure on the gas inside. And these tubes, they knew in those days how to make uniform diameter glass tubes, no problem. So he knew that the volume in there was directly proportional to the height because the circumference didn't change the same. So he just needed to measure the height. And the height here, this height was the measure of the pressure, right? So that's proportional to pressure. And this height was proportional to volume. So that's how he, he measured pressure and volume. And he just took that measurement and that measurement, and then he added a little more mercury, took another measurement here and here, and watched the change. So what he was doing was, his independent variable was pressure. He's controlling what's happening with pressure by adding mercury. And the dependent variable, the one that changed in response, is the volume. Okay. So now we can we can measure pressure and volume different ways. We can measure volume in liters, pressure in atmospheres. And what he noticed was that if you multiply pressure times volume, it's a constant. Right? And if you plot it, you get a curve. Right? As the let's see, we're missing volume here. Actually, they've got their axes reversed. The dependent, the independent, is supposed to be on the x-axis, but it works. It works either way. So you get pressure versus volume, and you get this curve. So as this one goes up, that one goes down. Or as this one goes up, that one goes down. That's called an inverse proportion. Pressure and volume. And as you multiply pressure times volume, you get a constant value. That's Boyle's law. Pressure times volume is constant. As long as you don't change this one or that one. Moles and temperature have to be constant, unchanging, to let these vary and follow this law. So that's Boyle's law. Now, that curve has a name. It's called hyperbola. Remember, if, if you've had, where did it get it? Geometry, maybe? Trigonometry? Yeah. Uh, this line never touches that axis, and that one never touches the other axis. That's what I remember from the hyperbola. I'm sure it has another definition. It's one of the conic sections. Remember conic sections? You have a cone. And depending on where you take your section, you get different shapes, right? You cut through here and you get a circle. Right? Uh, you cut like that and you get an ellipse. Uh, you cut like, uh, like this, like get a parabola. I don't know where the hyperbola fits in it. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> so that's Boyle's law. Well, that's not really useful because uh, this can change. All you have to do is just be slightly off of the temperature or slightly off of the mold and you can't use this data for any other experiment. Right. So, here's one of the ways that helps us use it. And that is if these conditions are equal to that constant, then if we change the, the pressure, We'll get another pressure here and a different volume. But they're both equal to the constant, aren't they? 
So that means by uh, the, the transitive property, A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then A is equal to C. So that one is also equal to that one. And we don't need to, we don't need the constant anymore. All we need is conditions before and after. And if you're just missing one, you can solve for it. Right. So if we say, like we have, uh, I don't know, 10 atmospheres and one liter, but over here, we decrease the pressure to two atmospheres, then what is that one equal to? Five, isn't it? Two times five is 10 and one times 10 is 10. Okay. So you just, as long as you have one unknown, you can always solve for it. So that's, that's the more useful version of Boyle's law before and after. Also, I, I hope I've said this before, scientists hate curves. If we can always get them, we'll take a straight line any day. So if we have pressure times volume equals a constant, how do we get a straight line out of that? Well, what if we say, let's put the volume on that side. Pressure equals K over volume. Let's factor out the volume. So K times one over volume. So now we have Y equals M X. We have a straight line. All we have to do is plot pressure against the inverse of volume. And we get a straight line. So if we do this, we get like that. Okay? Don't forget that. You'll need it when we do Boyle's Law Lab. Yeah, I guess. Um, let's go back. Wait a minute. Are we going to do it here? Let me see. Uh, no, we don't. Well, let's go back to. Come on, back, 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 back. A little more, a little more, a little more. There. No, that's not it. Come on. There. So if we use this data, I should say these data. Data is plural. Then we have uh, 25, 20, 10, 5, 4. 25, 20, 10, 5, 4. So that's the pressure in atmospheres. And the volume then is uh, 4, 5, 10, 20, 25. Okay, so what you would do is you would take these and just take the inverse of it. Right? So that's what? A quarter? This is two tenths. This is one tenth. This is 0 0.05. And this is point uh, oh. What is one divided by uh, four? Point oh four. Right? So this volume would be in liters. This would be in atmospheres. So what would the units of measure be for this one? Liters to the minus one. Right? The inverse of liter. Okay? So then you would just plot it out, pressure, and one over V, you would put, like if this was your origin, then you would have up to, say, 0 0.25 as your maximum scale. You would subdivide it by uh, 500. So that'd be 0 0.2, uh, 
0.15.1.5. That's a little off. Should be further down. But you get the idea. And then you just plot it. And when you plot it, it's a straight line. Okay. Okay, so there's uh, uh, the more useful version of Boyle's Law, and all you have to do is solve for the one that's unknown. Right? With this law, uh, P1V1 equals P2V2, all you need is three of them, and you can solve for the fourth one. You just be, need to be sure that your units match up, so if you have pressure the atmosphere is on one side, the pressure and atmosphere is on the other side. Volume and liters on one side, volume and liters on the other side. It could be volume and milliliters, it doesn't matter. Milliliters on this side, milliliters on that side. Or volume uh, or pressure could be uh, millimeters of mercury on one side, millimeters of mercury on the other side. But as long as they're the same, then the ratio still holds. Okay? That's Boyle's Law. I'm doing on time. One fifteen. Check one minute. Got thirty minutes. Let's see how far we can get. Uh, okay. So in this case, we just solve for the unknown. Then we plugged in our numbers. But if you're more comfortable, you can just write out P one V one equals P two V two. Plug in the numbers, and then solve for the unknown. The trick is you got to know what's before and what's after, right? Because if you put them in the wrong order, you're going to get the wrong answer. So in this case, the volume of gas when you want to know the volume of the gas when 15 liters of gas at 500 millimeters of mercury. Those are initial conditions. Those are uh, V1 and V1. The pressure drops to 125 millimeters of mercury. That's the after. That's the P2 to solve for the V2, right? So sometimes it's a good idea, if you know you're gonna be using Boyle's Law, pressure volume, set them up like this. Like that. And write in the numbers for those conditions. And you can see which one's missing. You need to develop some type of method so that you don't put the wrong numbers in Boyle's Law in the wrong place. Because if you do, I guarantee the multiple choice question, there's going to be one in there that fits your answer, but it's wrong. I mean, that's how multiple choice tests are made. Whoever makes them up says, hmm, what kind of mistake can the student make? Okay, switch these numbers. Okay, let's calculate it that way. That's one of the answers, right? So just because the answer's there doesn't mean you got the right one. That's a word of warning. All right. So let's get on to, uh, there's another problem you can, let's get on to Charles Law. Back up. Charles Law. Charles was a Frenchman. <clears throat> and he came along almost, well, more than 100 years after um, Boyle's. The reason Charles, one of the reasons that Charles had to wait that long, well, he didn't wait that long, <laughs> science had to wait that long to investigate gases in, with uh, relationships to temperature change was that they didn't have th thermometers. They didn't have reliable thermometers in Boyle's day. They knew how to hold temperature constant. I mean, one way, I mean, he could submerge his J-tube in an uh, ice bath, you know, water and ice, and that would be constant. But to actually measure the temperature took the development of a thermometer. And of course, they used mercury for that too because it responded to temperature changes with 
um, change in volume. And if you combine it into a very small, narrow channel, then a change in volume is translated into a big move in height. So, the system that was uh, developed uh, was uh, Celsius developed a temperature scale based upon zero at the freezing point of water and 100 degrees as boiling point of water. It could be easily reproduced anywhere on the planet. That was his main focus. Reproduce it and then produce a thermometer that was calibrated for 100 degree marks with zero and 100 as your, as your limiting. Then uh, Charles came along and used that system and measured the volume of gas here as temperature changed. So what he had to do was he had to be sure that these other two factors were constant. Uh, this was easy enough. You just confine the gas and don't put any more in, don't let any out. Yeah, you're good to go there. But how do you maintain pressure? One way is you've got a cylinder uh, and then you have a piston in it. So the gas is confined in here. And then you put some mass on top of it kilogram, two kilograms, whatever, and just leave it there, don't change. As long as you don't move that to another planet or the moon, <laughs> you're good to go. Because that, that mass is gonna exert the same force as long as you sit right there and don't move it. So now we've established um, constant pressure, constant pressure. So you can let the volume and temperature go. Now you have to, uh, surround that gas with something that where you can control the temperature and measure it. So we won't go into those details, but Charles succeeded in doing that. And he measured the temperature and the volume that responded to his change in temperature. So the temperature is the independent variable, volume is the dependent variable. Temperature will be down here, volume will be here. And he noticed that as the um, as the temperature changed, let's see, you don't want to put that on top. Yeah. So as the temperature changed, the volume changed to match it. Right, so when you put, when you change this one, if it goes up, that one has to go up too, to be constant. If this one goes down, that one's got to go down too. That's a direct proportion or direct relationship. Whereas, product equal to constant. That's an uh, inverse relationship. As this one goes up, that one has to go down. But as this one goes up, that one has to go up. Keep it constant. That's Charles' law. So we, we got some data, plotted it, got a straight line. So that's good. You didn't have to do any transformations. That straight line with the data. Now, some smart aleck by the name of um, Kelvin, actually that wasn't his name, that was his title, he was Lord Kelvin, uh, decided to see what would happen if we extended this temperature scale back here into the negative, and then we just extended that line. So when it meets the x-axis down here, what does that mean? That means that the volume is zero. At what temperature would our gas be zero volume if it were ideal? So that's what he did. He just extended the line and found out that uh, on the Celsius scale, it'd be minus 273 degrees. Would be zero volume for gases. The nice thing about Kelvin's new temperature scale, which now we call K, we don't say degrees K, we just say K, is that the starting point is absolute zero. So all of its values are positive values. 
And every calculation that we do using temperature is in K, not degrees centigrade. That's one of the reasons, because K is always positive. We don't have to deal with negatives and positives in the Celsius <coughs> system. But if you want to convert Celsius to K, you just say degrees, degrees Celsius plus 273. And we're going to leave it at 273. That works just fine for our purposes. So, <clears throat> Charles determined that that was a constant. And you can do the same thing with this one we did with boils. Say so this is before, say initial, and this is after. Right? So that's equal to that because of transitive property. So VI over TI equals VF over TF. Or V1 over T1 equals V1. Okay, you can solve for the unknown just like we did for boils. I'm running out of time. Eighteen minutes. I want to get through the laws at least. Okay, so that's Charles' law. Now, <clears throat> what if we want to investigate the relationship between um, volume and moles? We change the number of moles, what happens to the volume? Right. So we got to hold this one constant. We already know how to do that. Right. Uh, we need to hold this one constant. We know how to do that. And then we let these two vary. So Avogadro did that. And uh, actually, Avogadro's postulate preceded his law. What he said was, if you have two gases, this, and the volume of this one is equal to the volume of that one, okay? And the temperature <coughs> of that gas is equal to the temperature of that gas. And pressure of that one is equal to that one. Then we can say that the number of moles in this one is equal to the number of moles in that one. <clears throat> uh, at this time in 1800s, uh, catalysts were trying to get rich on chemistry. And most of that was happening in Germany, in Europe in general. But the uh, investors in these companies, sometimes they'd make money and sometimes they wouldn't. And when they wouldn't, they'd lose a lot of money fast. The reason being, they didn't understand how, how stoichiometry worked. They had no concept of numbers of atoms and numbers of molecules, how they interact. All they knew at th that time was mass. They knew a mass of this reactant and a mass of that reactant produced this product and that product. So when something went wrong, they didn't know how to fix it. And they were bringing pressure to bear upon their chemists to figure it out. So uh, industrial chemists and university chemists got together in a, in a little town in uh, uh, southern Bavaria called Karlsruhe. There was a college there, university. And they met there for two or three days in uh, 1860. And what they dis discovered was 
They didn't know what they were doing. They just <laughs> threw up their hands and everybody just, just walked out of the building. Uh, fortunately, there was a, a young chemist named Canizaro who had uh, done some research and based his research upon Avogadro's earlier work. At this time, Avogadro was dead. He has gone. So he couldn't be there to defend himself. But Canizaro uh, had reprints of his research paper. And he was handing them out as they were leaving. I guess he didn't have the prestige it took to stand up and talk to these people to their face. So he just handed them copies of his reprints as they were leaving, let them take them back to their various colleges and, and companies and read them. And when they did, the light bulbs started going on all over. They're solving problems based on this concept. The reason they knew that mass and mass were different, these two confined gases. So this mass is not equal to this mass. But they didn't know why. With this concept, now they knew why. Each one of those particles in there, molecules, atoms, was a different mass. And that's why the overall mass was different. You could have the same numbers there, but they would have different masses. Now you could relate the masses of individual atoms and molecules because you knew the same numbers in each one, and the only difference was the mass. Okay, so now they started getting a handle on uh, relative masses of individual atoms and particles, and it just snowballed from there. So that's why Avogadro gets uh, credit because Canizaro gave him credit in his publication. And that's where it went. Now, Avogadro's law uh, simply says that um, volume and moles are related like that, and they're constant. So as the number of moles goes up, the volume increases, as long as you keep temperature and pressure constant. So if this is initial and this is final, then you have another relationship. That's equal to that. And you can solve for your unknown. And it is a direct proportion. As one goes up, the other one goes up. It's like Charles' law where volume and temperature, one goes up, the other goes up. And uh, Boyle's is the inverse relationship. Still got time, I'm gonna keep talking. Um, so now here's a, an example of using that relationship in a chemical reaction. So there you have the decomposition of ammonia, the nitrogen and hydrogen gas. And the relationship is two moles of this produces one mole of that, and three moles of that. So the overall relationship of gases is two moles of the original reactant produces four moles of product. Okay. So if you go from two moles to four moles and all the other stuff is constant, two to four, then what should happen to the volume? It ought to be doubled as well. Doubled from there to there, double the volume. So now you can have those gases confined Keep the temperature and the pressure constant. And when you put that gas in there, decomposes, you measure the change in volume, you know that you've also increased, you have doubled the number of molecules in the process. And then you, you could further investigate. You just take the product gases and uh, isolate them and find out how much exactly you do have of each one. And the stoichiometry is just a matter of busy work from then on. Okay. So before we get to the ideal gas law, you 
you got these four relationships that we've investigated. You got pressure times volume, which is a constant. Then you've got uh, volume and temperature is a constant. And you got volume and moles is a constant. So that relationship, it puts them all together. This is the combined gas law. Pressure times volume over moles times temperature is a constant. And if we say initial, 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 and P is equal. Final, 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 final. So this is before, this is after. You can let them all vary if you want, as long as, as long as you um, have one unknown out of that whole mix, you can solve for it. But if you just hold um, moles and temperature constant on both sides, you get boiling law. If you hold um, pressure and moles constant on both sides, you get Charles law. And if you hold pressure and temperature constant, you get Avogadro's law. That's the combined gas law. Now notice, <coughs> this is, these are the laws, you can use these as long as you know before and after conditions. Right? But what if you don't know before and after conditions? What if you just know right now what is? Like that. Well, we give that constant a special value called R, the universal gas constant. And we know that if pressure is in atmospheres, volume is in liters, this is moles, and this is K, then R is going to be equal to 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole. You know that constant. Now you set that constant because it's not going to change. Set that constant equal to PV over NT. Then if you know three of these, you can solve for the fourth one. You don't have to know where it came from or where it's going, just what it is right now. We usually rewrite it. That's the way you'll see it most often. PV equals NRT. R is the constant. Okay, so if you know before and after, you can use the combined gas law for the various versions. Uh, if you only know what it is right now, then you can use this one. So if we were to conduct a reaction where you only have one gas product and you collect that gas, measure its pressure at a temperature, and the combined volume, and you can calculate how many moles of that gas you have in that container. And if you know how many moles are in that container, and you have weighed the container before you put the gas in it, then you put the gas in it, you find out how much the gas weighs, mass, moles, you know its molecular weight. That's one way to determine the molecular weight. That's what we're going to do with uh, Dumas method, the last one we do this semester. So that's the ideal gas equation. And we assume that the ideal gas remains a gas at all pressures and temperatures. That's what Kelvin did. He said, if you follow that temperature all the way down to zero volume, that's what the temperature will be. That's an ideal gas. It's a gas forever. Right down to its a point volume, like no volume left. But we know that doesn't happen. Because as you get closer and closer and closer and closer, the volume of the molecules mean something. Even if they don't interact, they still take up space. Okay. And we know also that if you cool a gas down far enough, depending on the gas, it'll turn to a liquid. Right? So it's not a gas anymore. Right? Uh, liquid nitrogen, if you cool it down to minus 195 degrees centigrade, you get a liquid. Uh, if you take... Uh, Helium, I think it is, and you cool it down to four degrees Kelvin, 
It's hurting religion. So, under those conditions, they're not ideal. But the ideal gas is uh, first this, and then we assume a point molecular volume, that is, the volume doesn't exist. I remember uh, geometry or algebra or whatever it is, teacher would do this. That point has no area, no volume. Right? It's just a point. Right? It has no width, breadth, has no depth, has no width. That's what we assume for uh, the ideal gas molecules. We also assume that the ideal gas, those molecules don't interact. When they, when they hit each other, they just act like billiard balls. They just bounce off. They don't interact in such a way that they would attract each other if they get real close, or they repel each other if they get real close. That would be an interaction. They don't do that. The ideal gas doesn't do that. And of course, they have to obey all the gas laws. Now, real gases, we know, do liquefy and some solidify. I mean, dry ice, carbon dioxide, cool it down enough, it'll turn to a solid. They used to make it in the lab. So we'd make dry ice. We'd have a cylinder of uh, liquid carbon dioxide, run it through this device, and you waste about half of it with the cooling effect. And the other half would turn into a solid, throw it in your cooler, and head to the field to collect samples. Uh, real gases do have volumes. They do have masses. And they do interact with other gases. When they get close, they either attract or repel. And they do interact with the walls of the container. That's one we can't get away from because if they didn't have to interact with the walls of the container, we couldn't measure pressure. Right? You insert your little device. If they didn't interact with anything on, in the around the walls of the container, you'd never know what the pressure was. So that's a real gas. Now, when can we treat a real gas as if it were ideal? Two conditions, high temperature, low pressure. Low pressure means molecules are still very far apart. High temperature means they're moving so fast that any interactions when they come close to each other, the, the speed and the violence of the collision just overcomes any interactions that they may produce. So what do we mean by high temperature, low pressure? Right here, right now. Right. In terms of absolute temperature, this is high temperature. Right? Like 298K, that's high. Uh, pressure, low pressure, relative to what? relative to 10, 20, 30, 40 atmospheres. You know, one atmosphere is low pressure. So right here, right now, the way we are, this is ideal condition for gases. So there's the ideal gas equation. Um, later on, when we, when we investigate um, other types of reactions, in which we need to include the uh, value for energy, which is the joule, then we'll use a different value, this one. But for this chapter, we're gonna be using that one because this has the right units, liters, atmospheres, moles, and K. So 0 0.08026 uh, is in your useful information. And I'm out of time. How far did I get? Yeah, we have got a few more things to talk about. So we'll pick it up here uh, Wednesday. Let's see. Are you guess? Yeah, right, uh, right here. So this is the 18th, that'll be the 20th. Okay. So I'm going to stop the session now. We'll see you Wednesday. All right. I should be there on Wednesday. Very good.
All right. Let's see. Stop the recording.